Hi, welcome to Punchline Talks. My name is Mark Owen, and each week I invite a panel of business experts or civic leaders to review the morning newspapers, find out what's happened in their own individual business and their own individual business sectors, and finally, what's caught their eye on this week's Punchline. But before we start, I'd just like to thank our fantastic sponsors, Hazelwood's Accountants and Business Advisors, and we couldn't do the show without them. Okay, let's meet the panel today. My special guests are Councillor Mark Hawthorne. He's a leader of Gloucestershire County Council. He's got a responsible budget of £650 million, 3,000 staff, and we'll find out what his views are on the budget. And also, we'll have a look at a clip of a video we've got of him as well, wearing different, different outfits. We've got Alex Rose. He's the Managing Director of Beards Jewellery in Cheltenham. 2024 marks the 220th year in business, making them one of the oldest companies in the county. So we'll find out more about that, but also about the jewellery trade and how it's fitting in the in this uh, cost of living crisis. We've got Dean Andrew Zanini. He's a Dean of Gloucester Cathedral. He's been in post for just under a year. He's a driving force behind the Gloucester Commission. And we'll find out all about that and why it's so important to Gloucester. And finally, never last but least, very popular on the show, we've got Glenn Collingwood back. He's a tax advisor with Hazelwood's Accountants and Business Advisors. OK, welcome to the panel. We're just going to quickly have a quick view review of the newspapers, courtesy of, courtesy of uh, the BBC. Right, OK, a quick rundown. Here's the Daily Mail. Don't leave our, count, our country defenceless, says the Daily Mail. The Mirror. Pension pinches. Tory budget bombshell. The I, Tory and uh, Labour and Tories do refuse to explain UK spending cuts before the 2024 election. The Financial Times, Hunt pulls 200 billion from councils after clawing back houses sale fund. The Guardian, UK to build port and shore of Gaza to allow A deliveries. The Sun, red, bullish. The Metro, I did nothing but show my baby love. The Daily Telegraph, London is now a no-go zone for Jews. And the Times, doctors to track patient stepped counts on the NHS app and the Daily Express. Brexit, Brexit is a great British success story worth billions. And the Daily Star, keep your filthy hands of our sausages. Apparently, they're getting smaller. OK, well, we don't want uh, we don't want that picture at this particular moment. We'll come back to that. OK. Welcome to the panel. Thanks ever so much for joining us today. I'm going to start having a little bit of a round robin about the budget. I'm going to start with you, Glenn. Was it a good budget? Yes or no? What was your key point? Was it a good budget? That's, I suppose, well, I suppose if you, uh, depends who you listen to, is it a good budget for the country? Well, of course, the uh, the government in power will say that it was and it addressed some issues that they've been meaning to address all along. I think um, in, in my, from my perspective, but given that I work in tax and we monitor the budget quite closely, it was quite interesting from our perspective in that we actually had something to write about because probably the last few have been rather where well, you get to the end and you know, I haven't really got much to say about it. Um, I think it was interesting in some of the changes they made. There was some actually some important surprises in there, which might be what well, might maybe come on to later. Uh, you know, something there for the working person because of reduction in national insurance. So was it was it a good budget? Um, I, I think you just we're just seeing somebody lining their feathering their nest for later, I think, is where we're going with that. OK, Alex, was it a good budget? What did you think of it? Been a business but entrepreneur. Um, if I'm brutally honest, I think it was a bit wet. Um, it, was, it was something of nothing. And I think that's partly it led by the fact that there is very little headroom to do much in terms of tax cuts uh, from a business perspective. We bang on about this every time there's an election and the budget about business rates reform still hasn't happened. No one's had the cojones to sit there and say, look, this needs completely overhauling. So that was disappointing. The national insurance um, reduction, I think, was great. But no one's talking about the fact it's completely offset by the council tax rises, which are, you know, councils need the money. I get that. Um, but the national insurance um, reduction is going to be offset by that. So actually, you're fairly neutral. So the tax burden remains pretty similar in one format or another, which is a shame because ultimately the electorate would like to have more money in their back pocket. And unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be the money to be able to afford to do that at the moment. OK, thanks ever so much for that, Alex. I'm going to go to you, Andrew. Dean, Andrew, what did you think? Budget, good or bad? 
Um, I think I would uh, I would concur with with others who've spoken. I think there are interesting elements in in the budget. Um, I think uh, that the the national insurance cut um, was something that was clearly welcome. Um, of course, we're very concerned um, in the church for those um, who are most struggling, particularly with the cost of living crisis, and that's something that's very much um, on our thoughts and in our prayers. Those who are most struggling at this time. And so I think that's something that's that's really very important to us. OK, thanks very much. We'll over to you, Mark. Obviously, just to just to put it out there that you are a Tory leader of the County Council. So good or bad budget? What was your overview? Were you sitting there thinking this is going to save us? Well, you see, I'm a bit of a nerd. So I, I, I listen less to what they say uh, in the House of Commons and look through the very long, detailed book that comes out for the snippets um, that affect us here in Gloucestershire. And there are three things, actually, that um, I took away from the budget. Um, the first one was the government reinstating the household support fund, £500 million. Um, there was a real cliff edge for us in local government that we'd had this money all the way through COVID and over the last couple of years, which are supporting houses, households that are struggling through the cost of living crisis. And the money just disappeared from the 1st of April. So the government did recognise that and put um, her half a billion pounds back into that, which is good news for us because we run those schemes locally. Uh, secondly, there was a bit, again, this is a bit nerdy for those, uh, um, but there was a, a big slug of money to uh, develop more uh, children's home accommodation, which is a, a national struggle at the moment. There's a real market failure around uh, high need support housing for children in our care. And that's a bit nerdy, but uh, for us, that was a really good step. The big one, Mark, which I'm surprised you haven't picked up on, is Great British Nuclear buying Oldbury. Um, that was the big announcement, which is going oh, to have a second, a, mate. Hold on. I, oh, well, no, no, maybe it's in your punchline. I have, I, I, I have read punchline. Don't worry, Mark. Um, but um, that is uh, huge news for us. And I was on a call last night. You know, we cannot uh, underestimate how big an investment that is into our county um, and uh, what huge uh, news that is for Oldbury and Barclay going forward. I, I totally agree. It's very, very exciting. I've been watching it for a long time, as you know. Uh, couldn't agree with that particular point. OK, let's go back to the papers. Thanks, everybody, for the panel there. OK, you've got two minutes, Glenn. What have you picked out from the papers, please? Sir? So uh, from the papers, as I reach around here to grab it. So I've got from the Times, I have Nationwide makes latest step in March of mutuals. So what's going on here is your classic building society, shall we call it, who in this article they say are some perhaps somewhat sleepy dogs, is what they're, su what they're suggesting, have woken up and they're getting a bit aggressive with acquisitions, aggressive in a good sense, and they're looking to purchase um, virgin money. So uh, that's a, uh, obviously a big takeover potential there. Then this is slightly connected to the budget, although at first you might not think so. So this is the inc obviously incredibly famous ITV's Mr. Vape, Mr. Vape, Mr. Bates versus the post office has been sold to 12 countries. I just one of the announcements that was made in the budget it was support for the film and TV industry, because the statement by the Chancellor was that outside of Hollywood, where we're, we've got the biggest um, TV and movie industry in the world, was what I think what he suggested. I wasn't quite sure of that, but but that's what he said. So that's a good example of actually that coming to fruition. We know how well how, how well that went. And you mentioned the front page already. Oh, this is an eyesight, I should have said. And uh, your front page there, Labour and Tories refuse to explain UK spending. And so the specifics of that is that there's a, a reduction to, um, uh, you know, uh, government spending of, uh, I think it said £20 billion, pounds, but not, not actually saying exactly where that's coming from or, or where they're going to, what they're going to reduce. And um, my personal take on that is, uh, for example, I deal with HM Revenue and Customs a lot. So I'm just isolating this to what I deal with. Well, the service levels at HMRC are shocking. They're the worst I've known in my entire career. And I'm not blaming any particular people in the in the business, in the organization for that. Clearly, something's wrong and it needs to be fixed. And taking away more funding is going to make it very difficult for the taxpayer to get the services they need. There's just not enough people. Let's be honest about it. You're trying yeah. to find a tax office. It's bloody ridiculous. OK, Absolutely. so thanks so much for that, Glenn. Alex, let's go over to you. Uh, what have you picked out from the papers, please? Uh, well, unfortunately, mine was digital. Having a stroll around Cheltenham this morning to try and find a paper actually was incredibly difficult. So business opportunity for someone there. Um, but what I did pick up on was the US um, election race that's continuing. It doesn't necessarily relate to Gloucestershire or the UK, but well, it's quite interesting to see that Donald Trump seems to be on track to make a comeback. Um, 
and it potentially beat Joe Biden, which I think is, uh, I have some American friends, I think even they are surprised that he's uh, making a comeback uh, and he beat Nikki Haley in, in that race quite definitively. So they clearly have uh, a huge support for him over there. Uh, and I think what's coming in the next uh, six months or so before the, their November election will be very interesting to see. And how a man who's been indicted um, and called up on so many counts of fraud, election, all sorts, can then rerun for the US presidency um, begs the question, how is that even possible? Uh, and I think it's a big comment on the state of US politics at the moment. And of course, whatever happens over there will eventually have an impact here. Um, you know, I think there are some positives to Donald Trump, believe it or not. Um, but majority, I think, of people would agree there's quite a lot of downsides to Donald Trump and his volatility. Um, Joe Biden, I think, is uh, incredibly sleepy, slow, doesn't lacks insp an inspiring uh, nature as a leader. Um, whereas I think Donald Trump is an incredibly good speaker and inspires the American people, and they've they've jumped on that bandwagon. Um, but I don't think it's thoughts about what happens after he gets in. So well, this is this is the scary to... thing. I, I mean, I follow politics and I followed the American politics as well. And I, and if you sit there and actually watch a complete Donald Trump speech from the beginning to the end, rather than the sound bites, that's when it really gets quite frightening. And he's actually yeah. quite, quite articulate, inarticulate. I mean, he just gibbers away and jumps for, around from all over the place. Uh, couldn't agree with you more, Alex. Thanks ever so much for that. I'm going to go over to you, Mark, actually, because obviously you're, you're linked to politics and stuff. So your your take on that worst nightmare, just very quickly? It was uh, interesting. I think it was one of the stories that I picked up on. State of the Nation speech, uh, I think it is. It's just taking place in the States. Um, and I think most of us staring across the pond will be uh, wondering what the hell's going on in the state of American politics. Um, you've got a rerun of the, the last presidential election that's pretty much baked in now uh, with two candidates that clearly are not able to command uh, respect across the nation. So whatever's going to happen out of that election, uh, America is going to continue to be heavily divided uh, politically and as a nation. And uh, that's not good for America and it's not good for the world. So it is... It is slightly disappointing that their, their, their system has trapped them with two uh, candidates who are both uh, old, there's nothing wrong with that, but both, I think, uh, very divisive. Heavily divided and heavily armed. That's the, <laughs> so, you know, that's the most frightening thing of all. Uh, any, anything ever quickly, Mark, one other story? Well, the other stories I picked up on, um, two very quickie ones, uh, Theresa May uh, announcing that she's uh, standing down. Um, not a surprise, I suppose, um, but uh, I was talking to a, a colleague of mine the other day and they reckon up to 300 MPs uh, could be turning over in the House of Commons at the uh, next general election. It's probably the biggest churnover of uh, members of parliament uh, for many decades. Um, and we're seeing a lot of the big hitters that we're used to seeing uh, leaving the political scene. I knew Theresa uh, really well when she was Home Secretary and I had some dealings with her uh, when she was uh, Prime Minister. She always had, I thought, a pretty raw deal. And uh, what she had to try and do over those two chaotic years was a challenge, I think, that would have broken anyone. But uh, I was a lot of time for uh, Theresa. The other one, which I thought me and you would find quite amusing, was the story in the Daily Mail about the goodie bag that all the Oscar nominations are getting. Um, so apparently this goodie bag is worth $180,000. Um, and it did get me to think about some of the goodie bags that me and you have probably picked up at various uh, events over the years. Uh, some of the uh, prizes were always worth having, you know, a bottle of beer, a bit of chocolate. And then it did often quite look as if someone rummaged at the back of their cupboard for something they couldn't get rid of um, and stuck it in. I think my, my most famous one was finding I had a light bulb uh, in a goodie bag. Which, um, I think, <laughs> and it was one of those old ones, which I didn't have any of the fittings for anymore. So, um, but uh, yeah, goodie bags at the Oscars and uh, certainly worth having if you were nominated. OK, thanks ever so much for that, Mark. I must admit, uh, I went to a, a thing at the Guild Hall recently. I got this ethical pen, which is quite nice. Another sort of bamboo pen from as But the, the best one of all, as I disappear off the screen here, has to be this one, which I went with Cree Catred. And uh, this is the number one uh, drink here. Uh, it was actually given to me by Johnny Wilkinson himself, uh, which, uh, which, uh, which I was quite chuffed with. Anyway, thanks so much for that. Andrew, Dean Andrew, what have you picked out for the papers, please, sir? So I've got a, um, a, a couple of stories on, on a slightly different vein. 
Um, today, it uh, occurred to me, is um, International Women's Day. So a story that caught my eye in the Daily Mirror was a story about Dawn French's former church that had once upon a time banned female vicars has got its first woman vicar in role. Um, Dawn French, of course, who famously played the vicar of Dibley. And, and I thought that was a <laughs> story for this day. Um, but also in the Church of England this year, uh, we're celebrating 30 years of the ordination of women as priests and 10 years of the ordination of women as bishops. And Bishop Rachel, our bishop here in Gloucester, of course, was the first woman diocesan bishop. So that is um, a particular celebration for us. And um, throughout the history of Gloucester Cathedral, uh, women in ministry, women in leadership have always had key roles, right from the time of St. Kyneberger, who was the founding of Gloucester Cathedral, of course, in the days when it was an abbey. And um, in a time when roles were, were, were usually held by men, so that was something really, really significant. And it's wonderful um, as part of our history and our celebration that women now particularly are able to be who they are called to be. And that's something really worthy of celebration. And um, we hope very much that the witness of women in leadership will be a strong encouragement uh, for gender justice and uh, give a really good message um, against the gender-based discrimination that can still take place in the world. So that was something that I thought was very cheering. The other one, a bit more light-hearted, I saw in the Telegraph, um, was about how half of cathedrals now allow dogs. The headline is, Dog Collars No Longer Worn Solely by Clergy As Church Embraces Well-Behaved Canines. And um, that was quite a, a timely story, because at Gloucester Cathedral, we have just started our own trial this month of allowing dogs in the cathedral. And um, that's something that's quite important, not least as a dog owner myself, and I've got Bertie the Jack Russell sitting next to me here at the moment. But also I think through the um, pandemic, we saw how dogs, pets, other animals were such an important part of people's well-being. And so as well-being is one of the, the, the key themes and priorities of us here at the Cathedral, I think we hope that trialling this and enabling um, a welcome for all um, will be important. And also, I think this says something about the importance of our stewardship of creation and how creation around us are hugely important and to give um, a sign of that and, and, and space for that. So that's something that I hope is really positive as well. I think that's fun, absolutely fantastic to let the dog into cathedral. No, I didn't realise you weren't allowed to take dogs into cathedrals. Anyway, thanks ever so much for that, Andrew. Um, Alex, I'm going to go over to you. I'm going to miss Glenn out a second. Go over to you, Alex, yep. very quickly. 220 years, beards. Oh, no, I don't look it, do I? It's great. <laughs> You're looking pretty good. Or really good face cream. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Alex, tell us about the company. How many how many people work there? What's the sort uh, of... So I, I'll give you a bit of background. I know we're a bit limited on time, so I'll try and keep it brief. Um, so it is... I am the sixth generation to um, look after the business, as we say. Um, and it comes down through my mother's side of the family. Uh, so my great, 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 great grandfather, Thomas Waite, uh, started the business uh, back in the 1700s. Um, and we can prove back to 1804 when we started that we were jewellers and watchmakers. Uh, there's quite a, a long history um, and historical archive of our time here in Cheltenham. Um, we now have a team of about 17 uh, here, which obviously everyone says, oh, you're a jeweller. That's quite a lot. And the reason for that is we manufacture our own jewellery here. Um, we remodel, so we have a team of goldsmiths, setters, designer, um, and that's on the jewellery side. And then on the watch side, we have two watchmakers who service look after watches for us. And then we have the retail team as well, um, who look after the shop floor and clients um, who have been incredibly loyal for the last 200 years. And it's quite interesting because it's a family business. We see everything. And our business, we see people come in when they... Uh, have children then they get engaged then they're married then they have anniversaries and then they pass away so we remodel the jewelry and what you tend to find is that we will look after one generation and the next generation will come and I'm quite fortunate that I've started to see that transition from generation to generation and of course 
the, the passing of the previous generation is not very nice and that's very difficult um, but you do see the new generation coming through so we see the children that are being born that hopefully will come back to us in 20 30 years when they want their engagement ring or birthday present uh whether it's an 18th or 21st so it's it's a it's a generational business, but it's also with generational clients as well. And we've been, as you say, looking after Chartland for over 220 years. And this is our 220th year. So we've got some plans for later in the year to celebrate that. Um, you may remember Diamond Rush. I don't know if you remember that, where we hit yeah. 10 diamonds around the county in aid of Maggie's. We stopped it uh, pre-COVID. Uh, that will hopefully be making a comeback later in the year. Um, so you're the first people to hear about that. Um, I've got a scoop already. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we, we get asked about it, but we've gone a bit quiet on it because it wasn't the right time to bring it back with COVID. Uh, now we feel it's a good uh, good celebration with our 220th year. And yeah, it's um, my job to make sure it goes for another 220 years. Uh, must be, that must be quite a burden to, you know, uh, across oh, the miners. The, it's the, fine. <laughs> <laughs> Go on then, just very quickly. Uh, have you got children? Uh, anybody coming behind? Yes. Uh, I have two children, five and them? seven, Jasmine and Amber. Um, and my partner, Sophie. Um, so, yeah, I don't think they'll come into the business. And in some ways, it sounds awful. I hope they don't. But the business can still continue without. Them. The business is really stressful. I think any business owner, uh, and Glenn, you'll have seen this a little bit with some of your clients, anyone who owns their own business. And I know you've interviewed some uh, business owners. You don't see the hard bit. All you see externally is the great bit. We're talking about how good things are, fantastic. What you don't see, and um, a friend of mine uh, who owns Vehicle Solutions in Cheltenham put a post up recently about the trials and tribulations of business ownership. That hard bit where your family have to support you through the challenging times, whether it's cash flow, whether it's lack of uh, revenue, whatever it may be, your um, those are the bits that people don't see. And so just a shout out to all the uh, independent business owners that go through all of those. Uh, roller coaster ride, we call it. I'll have to get you back on it for a, a big interview as well uh, about that. But uh, no, I couldn't agree with you. Well, couldn't agree with you more. Only my own business as well, obviously. Yeah, we, uh, exactly. it goes without go, goes without saying how difficult it can be. Thanks ever so much for that. A really good uh, uh, overview of that. Uh, I'm going to go to you, Mark. Actually, next. Okay, Mark Hawthorne, leader of the council. I've got this little clip of a video, so I'm going to see if I can share it a second. Uh, share the screen. So, uh, can everybody see that? Yep. Yes. Thank goodness for that. Okay, here we go. Here's Mark walking and talking. County Council's cabinet approved our budget for the next financial year. It may be hard to believe, but all of this has helped fund our plans for next year. It's true. Our energy from waste plants stops Gloucestershire rubbish going to landfill and instead turns it into green energy. The sale of this energy will deliver a £15 million boost to the budget, meaning unlike many other countries, who are struggling to balance the books, we haven't had to make dramatic cuts to services you rely on each day. I'll stop, I'll stop you there. Walking and, talk, walking and talking, Mark, it's pretty damn hard, actually, I must say, let alone getting changed that quickly. That's very impressive. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I've always got to change your clothes in the car. You never know what's around the corner, so, yeah. Well, Alex, Alex said he looked like Mr. Ben, but I don't want to go into that, but as you changed so much. Anyway, <laughs> so you took a lot of stick. Let's be honest about this, Mark. I've known you a long time. You took a lot of stick for that incinerator. So I wanted to give you a chance to actually answer some of your critics back because it, it's proven to be a bit of a su success story. It has been. It's been hugely successful. Um, I mean, it, 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 you remember the, uh, the, uh, the story as much as anyone else, Mark. Um, it was something that dominated Gloucestershire politics for nearly a decade, um, and, and very strong lines were drawn uh, on that this particular issue. Um, now, I actually represent the part of the city that's closest to the incinerator, and lots of people seem to think that uh, having incinerator was a vote loser. Well, I managed to get re-elected three times, so um, and talking to local residents, I think they understood the need for it. Um, because there were two things. Firstly, we were running out of uh, landfill. I think we ended up bringing the incinerator online with six weeks worth of landfill left at uh, Hempstead. So we were really cutting it very, very fine. Uh, but the second thing, this is that it gets rid of our waste in a really environmentally friendly way. Anything that goes into landfill is 20 times 
uh, more uh, uh, damaging to the environment than if we put it through uh, an incineration. And if you think of that massive building you see by the M5, uh, most of that is scrubbers. Most of that is actually the bit of the process that takes what comes out of the incineration, which is burning at extremely high temperatures and scrubs that uh, before it uh, enters the uh, atmosphere. Mostly what you see coming out of the top of it is steam. Um, but the big news this year is that actually, because we kept the energy from uh, the incinerator, it's delivered a £50 million pound boost. And boy, did we need it this year. There are a lot of councils up and down the country, especially county councils that have financially really struggled uh, to make ends meet this year. And what we've got in Gloucestershire is a completely reverse story. That income has basically meant that we've got a growth budget that we're able to invest in frontline service things like adults and children's um, and uh, into things like uh, road uh, and pothole repair as well. So it's uh, I, I do go on and on about it because it has really paid back for Gloucestershire and it's actually a huge asset to this county now. Well, like I said, you did take a lot of stick for it. It went on for a long time. We had the Extinction Rebellion outside uh, campaigning. I've been down there and I've filmed a, a lot of it as well and interviewed lots of times. Let's just quickly talk about politics, because politics, you've been in politics for 18 odd years, isn't it? Something like this. Has it changed a great deal? Is it a lot more aggressive or is the general public a lot more aggressive nowadays? Yeah. Politics is always changing. Um, and I think sometimes we reflect on thinking that uh, politics is more aggressive now. If you go back into the archives and look at sort of the coffee houses that were prominent in the 1800s and look at the uh, the sort of political debates and punch ups that quite regularly happened. Um, uh, it, it, politics hasn't changed. I think what has changed is the advent of social media. When I first got elected in 1998, and we didn't even have emails as councillors. We used to uh, have to write memos to officers on carbonated paper and they'd sort of send a, a copy back. It was all very old fashioned. Um, but of course, now we have social media and that means everything is 24 seven. Everything is happening instantly all the time. Uh, and as a politician, you've got to be on top of that all the time. So it's a lot harder a job. There's a lot more going along. There's a lot more people that have an opinion and are able to broadcast that opinion. And quite often, I think for voters, the most difficult thing is wading through all these opinions to try and find the truth. And I think that's a challenge, I think, as politicians, we continue to have. Uh, and I think that leads back over to Alex and what he was saying about Donald Trump, because the amount of false information, the amount of lies, the stuff and opinions out there. But the news is a little bit like that nowadays. It's no longer the news. It's more about opinion. That's the biggest well, part, 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 of the, part of the social media bubble is that a lot of people create bubbles around them that don't allow in different opinions. And that, I think, is something that isn't a great thing if you, if you want to, uh, you know, I like to read uh, The Guardian. I like to uh, go on to other news websites because I want to see what the opposition is saying. I, I want to have a breadth of opinion that I can uh, that I can go through. But of course, too often, I think people shut them themselves into little bubbles, uh, which is not great. Not great at all, but that, thanks ever so much for that. I'm going to go over to you, Dean Andrew, now, and uh, 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 let's talk about the commission. First of all, you've been in post for a year. Absolutely. Uh, congratulations on that. Who did you find Gloucester when you first arrived? Were, were we a friendly bunch? Absolutely. I mean, I love it here. Um, it feels in every way that this has been the right place at the right time uh, for me to exercise this ministry. So um, I can't be happier, actually. Um, the welcome that I've received here has been amazing. And um, I really love the community that there is here in Gloucester um, and the, the, the sense of togetherness that there is that I've seen over the course of the last year or so. Now, we, you and I are on the commission. You chair the Gloucester Commission. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Because not, not many people know about it, let's be honest about it. Yeah, the, so the City Centre Commission is um, a gathering of, of key stakeholders in the City Centre, um, from the city council, from local businesses, from local charities, from local institutions that have a key uh, part to play in the city centre. And primarily that stems from um, the regeneration projects that have been taking place over the last few years um, before my time here. Um, but now looking forwards to the kind of place that we want uh, Gloucester to be. And some of the things that we've been thinking about recently is about young people, how better to engage young people in the life of how we can make uh, the city a place that uh, we feel proud of and to be a place 
that is welcoming and inviting and encourages other people to join us and be part of what we do. And that seems to me to be very important in getting together the different stakeholders um, and involving different businesses and charities and institutions in this way seems to me a very collaborative and excellent way to be able to do this. Now, is there, there's around 25 people on the uh, committee, isn't there? Something there like are. Uh, and are you looking for any more people to join? And if so, who, who, who kind of are you after? Or is, that, are... Is, it, is it a full house now? I don't know. Church? Space for, for, for others to join. And in particular, I think we would really, really welcome the voice of younger people. Um, and so we're hoping that there will be some young people um, from the University of Gloucestershire who might join us. Um, and, and that will be particularly important as the new campus uh, comes into King's Square shortly. So um, that will be a really, really beneficial uh, addition, I think, to uh, the voice of what we do together to make Gloucester the greatest city in the United Kingdom. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. And it's been a real joy to be on that commission. So thank you ever so much for having me on there. OK, let's go back over to you, Glenn. Let's talk about the budget. I thought we'd give, uh, give us all a little bit of a break on the budget for five minutes. So what are your key takes? Because Hazelwoods, uh, we work very closely with Hazelwoods during the budget. It's something I'm, I'm very proud of. Uh, you guys, you know, hot off the press, really. What's the key things for, from you in the sort of tax side that, have, that, that connects to business? Yeah, sure. Well, th that's a good point on the business, um, because what connects to business in there is not actually that uh, there's not that much meat to discuss, actually. I'll, I'll talk about um, Alex mentioned earlier on about the reduction to national insurance and how that is helpful. Of course, that's helpful for people who on who are earning. That's that's like your consumer, as it were, uh, uh, as I'm sure Alex is uh, wholly aware, is that when you uh, employ somebody, you also pay 13.8 percent national insurance as an employer that two percent reduction doesn't affect that at all so it still costs as much for um, us to employ people i mean it's great that our employees of course are uh, are, are going to get more in their net pay that's brilliant but that, do that doesn't reduce the burden on the employer to um if, to employ them um there was a change to vat this is this is pretty much for your pretty very small business nowadays really so the uh, vat t threshold increased to ninety thousand. that's the that, that's the level at which you need to register that, that to. was a five thousand pound increase wasn't it it was very, five thousand yeah, yeah i mean it was just yeah, yeah. yeah. felt like a token really yeah that's right i mean what what's i mean is that is that even inflation nowadays well it probably isn't inflation is it i wouldn't have thought so 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 uh, but the, the only thing I, I i was speaking to some clients yesterday on that and where that is quite interesting is that um because when you get to a certain size of the business, yes, you have to register for VAT. If you're if you're end consumer, if you're if you're if you're selling to just people, well, that means it costs them a bit more because they've got to pay twenty percent VAT. So what that does mean, if you've got a decent sized business, and I only mean I don't mean huge, just decent sized, you're more likely to be undercut by smaller businesses because they don't have to register for VAT because of course you automatically look twenty percent more expensive than somebody else. And so uh, this was that uh, this was in the sort of property furnished holiday let side which got tampered with a lot in the budget so they're saying well you've got somebody who's maybe got a f one furnished holiday let property that they let out by increasing the VAT threshold yeah that's great for them because they got a bit of a less of an admin burden but it also means they can un un undercut the other bigger players and, and again when I say big I don't mean big corporates I mean people who might you know family businesses that own three or four properties you know that kind of thing um so so there are some negatives around that um, just picking up some perhaps some of the detail here so that, that for, for previously, if you earned over 50,000 pounds as a, as a family, as, a, as an individual and you've got children, then above that 50,000 pounds, you have to start paying back your child benefit, which is, of course, a benefit that um, we, we, everybody's been used to for many years. The thresholds increased to 60,000. And the amount that it's reduced over, uh, it's tapered is was was um, was half, which make, which is which is good news. So that, that that's helpful. For, uh, for working families families basically um there's some sort of technical stuff there's a there's a thing called multiple dwellings relief which is available for um when if you for stamp duty land tax if you buy more than one property at once that's been abolished and i just want to pick up a, rather on the technical just a bit of commentary on that is that the reason that's been abolished is because of abuse 
So this is this is where pe people are looking to buy a property and they want to try and get into this uh, relief that's available and they'll claim something like like a garden shed or something like that is a um, is a is a second property in the garden of the one they're buying and that 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 will mean that they'll pay less stamp duty land tax as a result and 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 this is a case of a few people ruining it for everybody else and that almost takes me back to my point at the start is the lack of funding for HM Revy and Customs because they can't identify those the only way they can fix it is to abolish it so it's so a, a valuable relief that has very good reason for being there which is obviously put in by parliament this isn't some weird tax loophole or anything like that this has been put in place to protect certain certain um, categories of people for example say somebody who's buying a property with a classic granny annex that sort of thing uh, so so consequently they'll pay more at stamp duty land tax than they should have done and that's because it's been ruined by others and i suspect this is my view is that it's just because it couldn't be enforced and that's probably the reason for it because they just couldn't they couldn't they couldn't police it so they just had to get rid of it okay that, well said glenn thanks ever so much for that really great input there okay we're kind of running out of time actually for the show we've got uh, just a few minutes left so we're going to quickly go through a pick of the punchline i'm going to start with you andrew what's the story from punchline please that's caught your eye the one that's caught my eye is um, the slice of Americana at Gloucester Food Dock. Um, and it, it particularly caught my eye because those um, who know me um, will know from my size and girth that I'm something of a foodie. Um, <laughs> oh. and, and so I hugely exciting. Um, and also, I think from the perspective of hospitality, which is, again, a key theme of the cathedral and a key theme of our mission to see the development of, of hospitality. I think it's great for society, it's great for the community, and it's great for business. And so to see um, new places emerging, I think is great news. Okay, thanks so much for that. I'm going to go over to you, Mark. What's the pick of the punchlines, please? Well, the one I picked out was your coverage of the uh, abuse that some of our workers are doing uh, roadworks to be doing. We've had some particularly bad cases this week. And they are under uh, investigation, so uh, hopefully the individuals uh, get caught. But just to give you a bit of a, a flavour, uh, we've been resurfacing Barnwood Road. We're doing a lot of resurfacing at the moment. That scheme's about uh, a million pounds. Most of that work's done at night uh, so that uh, it doesn't disrupt daytime traffic. Uh, and we've had a couple of uh, nights where people dressed in balaclavas and baseball bats have turned up and effectively smashed up equipment. So um, it is a pretty uh, extreme example of what goes on. But it does underline, actually, that too often uh, those of us that uh, are out there trying to improve uh, our communities, that, that those uh, doing uh, filling in potholes or doing road resurface are subject to abuse from members of the public. And it, I think it's a timely reminder, actually, that's just not not right. That's out of order. Those are, those are just ordinary people doing a job and they shouldn't be uh, subject to that sort of abuse. I uh, totally agree. Absolutely. Totally right. Ironic when everyone moans about the fact there's potholes. I know. Well, I can't win, so I get I get complaints about potholes, and then I get complaints about closing roads to resurface them. Yeah. It's uh, you know, it's yeah. an equal number on both counts. It has to be said. Okay, Glenn, pick up the punchline very quick. Yeah, very quick. Well, I was going to do the slice of Americana, but Dean Andrew picked that. So I swapped it. I swapped it to buy it to um, Oldbury Power Station, which Dean Mark, uh, um, Councillor Mark mentioned earlier on. So I've swapped it again to the, probably the worst heading I've ever seen on one of your articles, which is fantastic as the increase in uh, uh, van registrations in February, uh, which again has a slight uh, tax connection because there was a whole st storm in a teacup over pickups, uh, which has now been resolved, which I won't go into now, but uh, that's the one I've got. What are you on about? I got this fan fantastic, some fantastic headed. Okay, yeah. thanks so much. Uh, Alex, what have uh, you I've, I've gone with your Safer Cheltenham Festival. Uh, it's Cheltenham Festival next week. I, I obviously am chair of Cheltenham Bid. It's a voluntary role, so it's quite an important one for us as a bid. Uh, and me as a business, it's an interesting one. And uh, it's picked up on the fact that the, uh, the local councillors are having a war on we, rubbish and everything else. Um, we could talk about it for days, the Cheltenham Festival. I personally feel it's a great thing for Cheltenham. It has its downsides, of course, but it puts Cheltenham on the map. And I think that's a great thing. Um, so, yeah, interesting week next week. I wish everyone I can, uh, a safe week uh, of racing. OK, uh, my pick of the punchline has to be actually um, it was the fact that we got our uh, mobile recycling bins into King's home, actually. So we have six bins. Uh, I don't even know, but we're trying to raise money for Nelson's Trust. And the idea is that if you can collect all your old mobiles from from cupboards and 
other businesses and you know we've all got them lying around uh, and the idea is that we can actually give them to perhaps uh, people who have been abused and help them uh, and, and safeguard them. And the other thing is the precious metals can be actually taken out, extracted, and that can be collected. And uh, if there's enough mobile phones, we can raise an awful lot of money. We've already got a thousand mobile phones. Campaign's not been long going. But to get them in King's home for the rest of the season, I think, is a bit of a coup. So I'm very pleased with that. Anyway, I'd just like to thank our fantastic Panel been absolutely wonderful. Uh, fantastic, uh, fantastic, fantastic. Hazelwood's accountants and business advisor. Can't get more fantastic than that, Glenn. And uh, if you like the show, please like, share, subscribe, and we'll be back again next week. Cheers. Remember, it's all in the punchline. Bye.